Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracks will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Good day to you, my friend, and welcome to the broadcast. Thanks so much for making Bible Tract Echoes a part of your day. If you can right now, reach over, pick up your own copy of the Word of God, and join me as my Bible sits open to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You also want to probably get something on which you can jot some notes. We're beginning a new series of studies here on the subject of prophecy, and that's a hot topic in any era, and we'll explain how we're getting into that here in just a moment. So get your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. I've got a gospel tract in my hand. Do you know what a gospel tract is? Well, a gospel tract is simply a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. This one happens to be entitled Infant Baptism? Question mark. What does the Bible say? I'll be talking about that here in just a moment. But you get your Bible out, get pen and paper ready, and let's get ready to study the Word of God. Let me lead into our Bible study time this way. When I was a boy, and also even as a teenager, our church had prophecy speakers come in. They would speak for a whole week, and they brought large prophecy charts that were done on sturdy material that hung on a wire across the full width of our auditorium. That was the visual aids in that era. But I learned a ton from those prophecy speakers. But one phrase seemed to be used by many many of those speakers, and it came from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2. In that place, God told Habakkuk these words, make it plain, make it plain. When that prophet told his message and wrote out God's prophecy, he was commanded to make it clear, make it plain. It was to, well, make sense to the average regular person. There was to be no ambiguity. The average Joe kind of a believer ought to be able to understand it. Well, today I begin a series of broadcast on prophecy and those words from Habakkuk for my motto, for my title, my title of the series is this, Making Prophecy Plain. And it's my prayer that you and I will let the clear statements of Scripture on key prophetic events encourage our faith, motivate our witness, and just solidify our lives in walking with Jesus. So get your Bible, get pen and paper. I mentioned this gospel tract here a moment ago. It's an evangelism tool. It's a great way to extend the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. Do you know many, many people think they're going to heaven because they were baptized as a child? I talked to one last evening before making this broadcast. I talked to a young lady. She's a smart young lady, a cute young lady, but she was depending on her baptism as a baby to get her into heaven. When you open this gospel tract up on infant baptism, what does the Bible say? There is only one word, one word going kitty corner across the page in big, bold, capital letters. The word is nothing with an exclamation point. There is nothing in the Bible about infant baptism. When you go to the back panel of this gospel tract, it asks the question, who should be baptized? How should somebody be baptized? But then it asks this question. When should somebody be baptized? And here are given four illustrations, all from the Bible, about when somebody should be baptized. Baptism is taught in the Word of God. When should it happen? Would you like to know that? Well, get the gospel track from us at the end of the broadcast. My announcer will make things clear to you. You can, by the way, just go to our website and request a free sample pack out of our tracks. That web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. 
BibleTracksInc.org. If your Bible's open to 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verses 10 and 11. They say this, and I'm reading, of which salvation the prophets, now these prophets in reference here are the Old Testament prophets, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching by what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand of the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Stop, please, right there. Now, believe it or not, I think this Bible verse is the whole summary. It's the all of Old Testament prophecy in one summary format here, the prophecy concerning the coming of Messiah. Now, you know that God gave prophetic truth about a few things in the Old Testament. For instance, God prophesied that Abraham would become the father of a great nation, and God foretold of the rise and fall of certain kingdoms on earth and so on. But our focus in this series will be on prophecy concerning and surrounding the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, coming of Messiah, his first, second, and all some of the things that go along with that. The verses I read here out of 1 Peter chapter 1 say that three things are going to happen. Number one, Messiah would come. Now, that's implied here in these verses, and I say that because number two, It's foretold here that Messiah would suffer. He could not suffer if he did not come. So number one, Messiah would come. Number two, Messiah would suffer. And verse 11 says, number three, Messiah would bring in glory. Now, friend, that much is doggone plain. You can't get around that. All kinds of booklets and articles and sermons have been preached about Messiah's coming. They talk about how he would come, and that's foretold. You know the passage out of Isaiah 7 where it says a virgin shall conceive. The Bible prophesies where he would be born. Micah chapter 5 says he'd be born in Bethlehem. And you know how much about the prophecies uh, that surrounded the time that's coming here as you're hearing this broadcast and its original giving. Christmas is coming and so much of the prophecy concerning Christ's birth is coming, his first coming to earth. Our focus in the series is going to be about the foretold suffering of Messiah and the glory that should come. These two, well, seemingly contradictory things have often confused Old Testament Bible teachers. I'm talking about Jewish Old Testament teachers, and they frankly still do today for many Jewish scholars, especially those who deny that Jesus was the Messiah. Let me remind you of some of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the suffering and the glory of Messiah. First of all, jot it down, Psalm 22. Now, that psalm foretold the Messiah, that Messiah would suffer. It begins with those famous words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then Psalm 22 talks about the the Messiah's hands and feet being pierced, his bones would be out of joint, and that they would cast lots for his clothes. Now, all that happened. Where? It happened at Calvary. Isaiah 53 is also all about the suffering of the Messiah, his burial, and so on. That's undeniable. But then we read in other places, places like oh, Psalm 24 and Isaiah 11, where the Messiah makes a glorious kingdom. Psalm 24 repeats these words, and I'm reading now. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the king of glory shall come in. That's repeated in Psalm 24. But then over in Isaiah chapter 11, we read that Messiah will rule with righteousness and he will judge on behalf of the poor. Then it says that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Now, these words of Messiah's ruling on earth and bringing in glory, that has not happened yet, and you know it. You begin to understand why the Old Testament Jewish teachers got confused at times. They struggled. They struggled with how both the suffering and the glory could both be true about Messiah. They settled it, on, at least in the minds of some, by saying, well, there must be two messiahs that are coming. 
Now, you know that uh, why the Jews rejected Jesus when he came and performed his miracles and died on the cross. You see, they saw the suffering part of Messiah, but what they really longed for, what they wanted, what they wanted to see fulfilled was the glorious ruling part of Messiah, and that wasn't happening, and they didn't like what was happening. They rejected Jesus as Messiah because, well, they didn't understand why Messiah had to suffer. Jesus understood these two sides of the messianic prophecies. He ought to. Number one, he's the author of scripture, as you know, but they're all about him. In Jesus's first sermon, his very first sermon, which is found in Luke chapter four, beginning at verse 16, in that place, Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah 61. In that passage, both the suffering and the glory of Messiah are foretold. And as Jesus was reading the text from Isaiah 61, Jesus, I mean, he just flat out stopped in the middle of of the passage. He stopped and he closed the scroll. He stopped, though, after the part about how Messiah would preach the gospel and heal people and setting prisoners free. Jesus did not read the part there in Isaiah 61 about the glorious kingdom. But when Jesus stopped his reading, he closed the scroll and he said these words, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, Jesus, the author of scripture, the Messiah himself, he split Isaiah 61's prophecy into two parts. He split it up to the suffering Messiah. He fulfilled that part of his coming. Before he ascended, though, back into heaven, Jesus promised he would come again, and when he does, he'll fulfill the glory part. Here's a very critical truth we've got to get a hold of. That generation who experienced Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it was done openly. Jesus is coming to earth, his birth. People knew about it even from other parts of the Middle East and the wise men came and so on. The shepherds knew about it. His birth was done out in the open. His death was done out in the open. His miracles done out in the open. His resurrection done out in the open. But those who saw it still rejected him as their savior. But because they rejected him, those will not be allowed to enjoy the future glory at Christ's second coming. But friend, what saddens me, what concerns me, is that just as they will not be part of the glory, neither will you, dear friend, if you reject Jesus as your Savior, your suffering Savior, your sin. Friend, your sin is so bad, so awful. My sin is so bad, so awful that somebody had to suffer to pay our sin debt. That's Jesus. The holiness of God had to, be, had to be met. The righteous standard of holiness had to be dealt with. Jesus dealt with it with his shed blood. Have you received him as your Savior? If you haven't, do that right now. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309 309- 828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website, Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.